Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys. Section 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys, A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites, by Amelia B. Edwards. Chapter 5. Cortina to Piève de Cadore, Part 2. Next morning, however, there seemed to be as many as ever in the fair, which was kept up throughout the second day with undiminished spirit. This second morning began with a wedding. The order of the bridal procession was as follows. First came the indefatigable brass band, numbering some twenty performers, then the bride and the best man, then the bride's father and mother, then the bridegroom walking alone, and lastly some fourteen or fifteen friends and relations of both sexes. In this order they twice paraded the whole length of the town. The bride wore a black alpaca dress, the usual black cloth bodice and white sleeves, and a gorgeous apron of red and green silk fastened behind with a pair of quaint brass clasps. Neither she nor any of the other women on this occasion wore hats, but only an abundance of silver pins in their neatly plaited hair. Having entered the church, they all took seats in the aisle about halfway down, and the band went into the organ loft. Presently the bridegroom went up by himself to the altar and kneeled down. When he had knelt there a few minutes, the mother of the bride led her daughter up, placed her at his left hand, and there left her. After they had both knelt there some five minutes longer, the priest came in, followed by the old bell-ringer who acted as clerk. The bell-ringer then lighted a pair of long wax tapers and handed them to the priest, who blessed them and gave one to the bride and the other to the bridegroom. This was the beginning of the ceremony. Then the priest read the marriage service in a low voice and very quickly, only pausing presently to ask for the rings, which were handed to him on a little glass dish by the bell-ringer. The priest, having blessed the rings, first gave one to the bridegroom to place upon the finger of the bride, and then gave the other to the bride to place upon the finger of the bridegroom. During all this time they never parted from their tapers, but shifted them from one hand to the other as occasion required. At this stage of the ceremony the bridegroom produced some money and gave it to the bride. They were then profusely sprinkled with holy water, and this concluded the marriage service. High Mass was next performed, as yesterday, with the full band and organ, the newly married couple remaining the whole time upon their knees before the altar, with their lighted tapers in their hands. At length, when all was over and the congregation was about to disperse, the bridegroom got up coolly and walked out of the church, leaving his bride still kneeling. Then her mother came up again and led her away. The bridegroom, without so much as looking back to see what had become of her, went and played at bowls in the piazza. The bride went home with her parents, took off her finery, and shortly reappeared in her shabby everyday clothes. It is, perhaps, Tyrolean etiquette for newly married persons to avoid each other as much as possible. At all events the bridegroom loafed about with the men, and the bride walked with her own people, and they were not once seen together all the rest of the day. One of the pleasantest excursions that we made at this time was to the Landro in the Holstentin Thal, about twelve miles from Cortina by the Austrian post road. On this occasion our landlord provided a comfortable little chaise on good springs, with a seat in front for the driver, and the chestnut appeared in smart harness with red tassels on his head and a necklace of little jingling bells. With Giovanni again to drive, we started early one lovely July morning, following the course of the upper Ampezzo Valley, skirting all the lengths of the Tofana, and seeing again its three summits in succession. Being so long in the ridge, the great height and size of this mountain can only be appreciated by those who see it from at least two sides of its vast triangle, from the Tresassi Pass on the southwest, and from the high road on the east. Good walkers with time to spare may complete the tour of the mountain by ascending the Val Travernanza, which divides the Tofana Ridge from that of the Monte Lagazui. Their pyramidal peak on the side of the Tre Sassi has been repeatedly ascended by hunters from Cortina. The central peak was achieved by Dr. Groman in 1863, and the north peak was reached in 1869 by Mr. Bonney, 
who describes the view looking over in the direction of Bruneck and the Grosse Venediger as one of the finest among the eastern Alps. The highest peak, according to the latest measurements, reaches as nearly as possible to 10,724 feet. From Cortina the road runs for some distance at a level of about 60 feet above the bed of the Boita, and passes presently under the shadow of a kind of barber's pole painted with red and white stripes, which here juts across the road at an angle of 45 degrees. As we prepare to drive under it, the door of a little hut adjoining, which we had taken till now for a good-sized kennel, flies suddenly open, and a small, withered, excited old man flings himself into the middle of the road, and demands forty-eight kreutzers for toll. Becoming learned in the ways of the place, we soon know that a white and red pole always stands for a toll-bar, while a black and yellow one indicates the boundary line between Austria and Italy. From here the road now begins to ascend, and the mountains to close in. New peaks, snow-streaked above and wooded below, come into view, and the great crag of Putelstein, once crowned by a famous medieval stronghold, shuts in the end of the valley. The old castle was leveled to the ground in 1867, and there is some talk of a modern fortress to be erected on its site. At this point the road swings round abruptly to the right, winds up through the pine woods behind the platform on which the castle used to stand leaves the noisy torrent far below, and, trending eastward at right angles to the Ampezzo Valley, takes, in local parlance, the name of the Thal Tedesco, which, however, is not to be found in either Mayer's or Arteria's maps. Here also a board by the wayside informs us that we have entered the Distretta of Velsberg. And now the road leads through a succession of delicious grassy glades, among pine woods loaded with crimson and violet cones, and festooned with the weird gray beard moss of the upper Alps. Wild campanulas and purple gentians, deep golden arnica blossoms, pink daphne, and a whole world of other wild flowers, some quite new to us, here bloom in such abundance that the space of green sward on either side of the carriageway looks as if bordered by a strip of Persian carpet. Meanwhile, through openings in the wood, we catch occasional glimpses of great dolomite peaks to right and left, and, emerging by and by upon an open space of meadowland on the borders of which stands a tiny farmhouse, we see the fine pinnacles of the Cristalino, 9,238 feet, rising in giant battlements beyond the sloping ground upon our right. And now the road crosses a rough torrent bed, stony and steep, and blinding white in the sunshine. Here we alight and make our way across from boulder to boulder, while Giovanni leads the chestnut in and out among the shallows. And now as we emerge from the pine woods, a new dolomite, a huge, dark, mournful-looking mountain, ominously splashed with deep red stains, rises suddenly into towering prominence upon our left, and seems almost to overhang the road. What mountain is this? For once Giovanni is at fault. He thinks it must be the Crota Rossa, but he is not sure. Finding a mountain, however, here set down in Mare's map as the Crepa Rosa, and in Artaria as the Rothwand, we are fain to conclude that it is in each case the same, with only a difference in the name. Unlike all other dolomites that we have yet seen, the Crota Rossa, instead of being gray and pallid, is of a gloomy brownish and purplish hue, like the mountain known as Black Stairs, near Enniscorthy in Ireland. Going on in the direction of Sludervak, and looking back upon the Crota Rossa, it constantly assumes a more and more threatening aspect, rising cliff above cliff towards one vast domed summit, just under which is gathered a cluster of small peaks quite steeped in blood color. From these, great streaks and splashes of the same hue stream down the barren precipices below, as if some great slaughter had been done there in the old days of the world. Passing Schluterbach, a clean-looking roadside inn, we come presently in sight of the Duran Sea, a lovely little emerald green lake streaked with violet shadows and measuring about three quarters of a mile in length. Great mountains close it in on all sides, and the rich woods of the lower hills slope down to the water's edge. The clustered peaks, the eternal snows, and glaciers of Monte Cristallo, the towering summit of the Piz Popina, and the extraordinary towers of the Drezinen come one after the other into view. As for the Drezinen, they surpass in boldness and weirdness all the Dolomites of the Ampezzo. 
Seen through an opening between two wooded hills, they rise abruptly from behind the intervening plateau of Monte Piano, as if thrust up from the center of the earth like a pair of tusks. No mere description can convey to even the most apprehensive reader any correct impression of their outline, their look of intense energy, of upwardness, of bristling, irresistible force. Two barren, isolated obelisks of pale, sulfurish, orange-streaked limestone, all shivered into keen scimitar blades and shark-like teeth towards the summit, they almost defy the pencil and quite defy the pen. For the annexed illustration, however, so far as mere truthfulness of actual form goes, the writer can vouch, having sketched it very carefully from the best point along the borders of the lake. At Landro, a clean and comfortable inn standing alone at the head of the lake, we stayed to feed the horse and take luncheon. Here we were served with excellent cold salmon from the Miserina Lake and hot cutlets. Everything about the place looked promising. The landlord and landlady and their son, a bright lad of about seventeen, spoke only an unintelligible kind of German, but were cheerfully disposed and most obliging. Thinking that it might be a pleasant place to put up at for a few days, we inquired about rooms, but every inch of the house was occupied for the whole summer by a large party, chiefly English, including a member of the Italian club Alpino. This gentleman, followed by a gigantic St. Bernard dog, came in while we were at luncheon, marvelously attired in a brilliant scarlet flannel blouse and high black riding boots, in which costume, followed always by his dog, he had that morning been up a difficult ice slope of Monte Cristallo. Luncheon over, we strolled and sketched a while beside the fairy waters of the Duran Sea, a lake into which three torrents flow, and from which no stream issues. Why it never overflows its banks, and where the surplus water vanishes to, are mysteries for which no one has yet accounted. There has been talk of hidden clefts and natural emissaries in the bed of the lake, but it is obviously unlikely, to say the least of it, that the supply and the drainage should be adjusted with such nicety. Why, therefore, the Duran Sea is always full, and never too full, remains to be explained by men of science. Of the three great mountains seen from Landro, it may be as well to mention that the Drezinen, 9,833 feet, has been lately ascended by members of the Austrian or German Alpine clubs, that the Piz Popina, 10,389 feet, was first achieved by Mr. E. R. Whitwell, and that the highest peak of Monte Cristallo, 10,644 feet, was gained by Dr. Groman in September 1865 from the Cristal Pass, beginning on the side of the Tre Croce. Starting from the Duran Sea, the road again turns northward, and so runs nearly straight all the way to Tolblock, a distance of about ten more English miles. Looking up the vista of this narrow glen from Landro, one sees the snow-capped mountains of the Puster Thal closing in the view. Returning to Cortina in the pleasant afternoon, we left the carriage at a point not far from the toll-bar, and strolled homewards by a lower path leading through fields and meadows, and past the ruins of a curious old turreted chateau, one tower of which now serves for the spire of a little church, built with the stones of the former stronghold. End of section 11